Welcome to Camera Ready and Able, the podcast that explores the intersection of media change and personal growth. I'm your host, Barbara Barna Able, and my calling is to help you tap into your superpowers to thrive on camera and in life and to make an impact on the world. This episode is brought to you by the phrase on message, which simply means saying things that agree with the official position of a political party, organization, business, or brand. And that can also and should include being true to your own message. Here to discuss is Johanna Masca, who is an expert bar none on the how and why of being on message. Johanna shaped the message and image of Barack Obama, beginning with the Iowa caucuses in 2007, all the way through being White House Director of Press Advance until 2015. Since leaving the White House, Johanna has been the CEO of Global Situation Room, a highly regarded public relations firm and is a political contributor to News Nation, frequently appearing on their program, The Hill and is the host of her recently launched podcast, Press Advance, which is garnering rave reviews from both Democrats and Republicans and incredibly launched in the top 10. So um, as a podcaster, I'd love you to explain to me how you did that, which is simply (laughs) amazing, but not surprising and so well-deserved. So welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you, Barbara. I'm so grateful to be here. And I had done a podcast with other women from the Obama administration, uh, previously, Darian Page and Alejandra Campoverdi. So uh, this was our my second podcast, and I don't know if it's because our folks just dis- rediscovered us, but it was really like a terrific surprise, and I was very proud not only that the podcast was resonating with so many people because it was in the top ten, but because it was actually getting shared by Republicans and Democrats. And that I feel like is so missing these days in our media climate where we can find the things we do agree on. And so that to me was why I was most proud of the podcast success. I think it's incredible. So what is the on message of press advance? Well, press advance is what I did in the White House. It is setting up the president's image. I started at the beginning of Iowa caucuses when we were, you know, setting out hay bales for people to come sit around in a circle and listen to a candidate. And you got to remember that at times like those, it's small groups of people. You know, you have 30, 50 people in a room and then grew to uh, work with him, traveling with him around the world, um, you know, setting up events Uh, where the stakes were extraordinary, whether it was the live address to the nation on the anniversary of Osama bin Laden's death, or whether it was, you know, meticulously planned election night, those, that was my job. It took detail and focus, but my goal is actually a play on words with press advance because I want to press advance on this toxic moment in politics. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the way we got elected the way we brought together people and um, President Obama inspired people, we probably lost some of in the administration, I'll just be honest. But also it was by our motto, respect, empower, include. We have to listen to all people and we have to be willing to engage with all sorts of people. And so my first season is actually talking with me, talking with Republicans about this moment we face, some of the candidates, um, it's deep dives into a lot of the candidates because too often our media climate, they'll talk about the polls or something, but they won't talk about who Mike Pence is as a person. And so I dive deep with Alyssa Farrah Griffin, who of course worked with Mike Pence. Mike Pence is a man who was a Democrat. He was someone who actually, I know nobody knows, he started as as a Catholic Democrat in his life. He um, you know, was a big follower of Martin Luther King Jr. He has always actually kept in touch with Martin Luther King Jr.'s family. He was someone who had his own radio show in Indiana. And I actually go back and find some of those radio clips. And he had run for Congress and he had been someone who had used dirty tactics, um, negative campaign tactics and lost and then learned from that and decided he was only going to run on a positive message. He wasn't necessarily going to win win re-election when he got picked up by President Trump on his ticket, and then of course was vice president, but served in that administration and really kept a back seat for a long time until 
of course, January 6th, when he was asked to do something that he regarded as um, unconstitutional, because it is, but also high, highly unethical, and an ask that he did not, um, he was not going to follow. And so he broke from the president. So we talk about substance. And I think that's one of the things that's important to me on message. You know, what I believe our White House thrived with is that President Obama was talking about substance. In Iowa, you know, beginning of the caucuses, he was talking about the high price of arugula. And I remember at the time, the national press who towed it into Iowa, and I grew up in parts of Iowa, parts of Illinois. I, I was raised from fifth grade on in Galesburg, Illinois, but I grew up along the Mississippi and was born in Kansas. So this is, you know, I'm a Midwesterner. And uh, the truth is, you know, Midwesterners, they grow arugula and they sell it to the, you know, various locations. Well, President Obama, early on, he said something about, you know, the high price of arugula at this event and all these national journalists who toe dip in and don't know much about our lovely state. They're like, oh my God, he talked about the prices of arugula at Whole Foods. You know, there's no Whole Foods in Iowa, which is true. But who do you think grows the arugula and is trying to tap into that Whole Foods market? That's Iowa farmers. That's I had plenty of arugula at our farmers market. And so um, President Obama was talking about substance the entire time. He was taking questions. He would do it, boy, girl, boy, girl. And, you know, he would take questions from the audience and really engage with people. And I think that was our strength and our superpower. It wasn't that we told everybody what to say because we didn't. It was actually that we told people to listen. Ooh. What I just heard in that is not telling people what to say is that part of the message was about values. So to be on message is to be in sync or in alignment with the values, right? So therefore, is that a little bit of what you're trying to say or no? Yeah, no, mm -hmm. President Obama was such an incredible leader about values. Um, I remember early on in the Iowa caucuses, he had made a mistake and um, he called everyone on the team together in an all hands meeting and said, I am going to make mistakes. I am not a perfect person. None of you are going to be perfect people, but we just have to try to do better for the American people. And that, that transcended down throughout our campaign. So, you know, our, um, there was never a fear that the boss was going to light into you. I mean, there was a fear of you better be prepped. You better know every single question he's going to ask you because he asked very tough questions all the time. But there was a never a fear that he was going to light into you. There was a fear of you not doing a good enough job for your boss because you, you admired him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the challenge of true leadership is making sure that people are following you, not because you've instilled fear in them, but because you've instilled hope and respect. And I think that a lot of our politicians these days could learn about that. A lot of our corporate leaders and a lot of our media could learn from that, our media leaders, that that is more powerful than anger or venom or consuming some mass number of followers who are just going to follow you to hear you trample on people. It's that that we can mutually agree on, which is that America has to include us all. I could not agree more. And I, I had a wonderful coach on the podcast named Iggy Perillo. Her episode was called Dealing with Bozos and Bullies. And um, she was fantastic. Shout out to Iggy. So I wanted to ask you, I was thinking about this as I was prepping for our episode was um, especially, you know, your background. So you're working in a collaborative effort. You're not, you know, independent yeah. at that point. Right. And so the idea of being on message is, is like in music, you have a bunch of voices and that have to share this message. And so all those voices can be in harmony expressing that message, or you could wind up being very discordant and like, you know, horribly off key. So I was curious about that because that also is the aspect of um, 
I think one is collaboration and two is what is that adaptability to meeting the message to people, to the moment? How do you yeah. do that? Because I think that's relevant in any job in any situation for people. Yeah, no, and it's it truly does take a chorus. But I think we're moving towards a time in which we're recognizing that everyone who's in America has a, a, their own story. We're getting to this moment though, where I hope we recognize we shouldn't speak for others, but instead let them speak for themselves. So um, to the extent that we can bring people to the table where we have disagreements or whether they have a story that um, you know, you may have a different experience, we can hear from those people themselves. So if you're at a corporate culture, I think one thing that's really important is sometimes there's like a backlash to one particular thing that happens. And they'll say, oh my God, you know, right now, because of what's going on, we need to elevate these particular voices. And the truth is they should be elevating those particular voices of all sorts of different communities throughout the entire year. Shouldn't just be because there's one month. It shouldn't just be because there's something that happened. It should be a concerted effort year round. And that does include conservative voices at organizations. And that was one of my big frustrations when I was seeing, you know, in the aftermath of uh, President Trump's election, where I think a lot of people were caught off guard. And, um, you know, the, the truth was Russia didn't elect President Trump. Americans elected President Trump. And there are a lot of Americans who have all sorts of fears of, you know, different um, calibers. And maybe they don't express them all the time. But what we need to do is not shut down someone who we disagree with but actually listen to that voice. So um, I think that chorus right now, I was really proud during the Obama administration, well, the campaign really, because we did have that chorus. There were people of every different background. There were plenty of Republicans who were supporters of President Obama who would come forward in that chorus. I think some of the mistakes we made was when we went into the administration and it's important to get people with experience, but we hired a lot of people who were like from the Clinton administration who were kind of had um, experience, but didn't necessarily live the same respect and power include that we lived. And, you know, a lot of those folks have now actually exited politics or out in different ways or have gone out to have, you know, to launch campaigns of themselves and they may be in, you know, cities or in states. But um, that chorus was really strong and beautiful because like I said, it was as much about listening as it was about talking. And in doing that, I think we shifted the momentum and had what was the most recent historic landslide of an election. Now, if we are talking about unity and this is something that I wrestle with all the time. I think President Obama is wrestling with this very much so. You know, I started watching his Netflix series working or kind of based on Stud Circle working. And at the end of the first episode, he is asked by a woman who is barely getting by if he feels at peace. And he said, yes because he said he had essentially what she had said she wanted, which was his kids were kept. He had a rocking chair on the front porch of a house where he could sit. And then he said, but I worry about what comes next. And I think he actually worries way more about that what comes next than he lets on. And I, I'm conscious that the person I worked for is someone who did want to represent conservative views and liberal views and have the debate of different people with different perspectives and come to the right decision ultimately. And right now, I'd say too often we're silencing our critics, and a lot of people are doing that. People within our orbit are doing that, where they're saying, you know, 
whether it's the Biden administration that's asked something tough and they say, that's not even an issue. I, I think it to just interrupt you. I mean, I think one, I think that uh, we have a collective anxiety about what comes next. And then two, we've been having this conversation around our dinner table at home about the shutting down of any opposing voice, which leads me into my next question mm -hmm. for you, actually, because um, I mean, I, I suppose it's always happened, but it's accelerated, to, you know, just to the nth degree because of social media and a clickbait culture and, and you know, how the media business exists. And then also, um, you know, personalities, whether it's cancel culture or just the notion of like the loudest person at the event seems, you know, to dominate. So I wanted to ask you about that. It's like how to get a message out in such a fractured, I mean, literally on a practical level and, and to go a little bit deeper, I was thinking about this and I'm date stamping the episode, but you know, with the um, crazy smoke we've had in New York city this week, mm. I was very conscious of people walking around who I realized didn't know, right? And I, when I grew up, we had three television networks and a UHS, and there were multiple newspapers in New York. So, and so people would have been selling them on the street and, the, and everybody listened to the same radio. My point is everyone would have known smoke was coming down from Canada. We have the world's worst air quality in the world right now, stay inside, wear a mask. And I thought, oh my God, this is, especially after the pandemic, yeah. oh my gosh, we're living in a place. There are people who are literally walking around, have no idea because we've become super siloed for a variety of reasons. And because there's, you know, fractured media, but also because distrust in the media and distrust mm -hmm. with where information comes from. So super long winded way to go into with your expertise, Johanna, how do you, okay, one is to craft a message, but how do you even get it out there? Yeah. I go back to the beginning of Iowa caucuses when Barack Hussein Obama was not going to be the nominee. And, um, and how did we get to a point in which we got him overwhelmingly elected? It was by talking individually to people and by building a grassroots movement. Um, Barbara, I'm part of that right now of what they're trying to do at News Nation because we have such a toxic media environment where you know, it just, people lash out without facts all the time. And I was even saying to my husband, you know, I was on uh, yesterday and, um, and I was posed a question from a conservative uh, pundit that my husband thought was just factually inaccurate. And it had to do with guns. And he was like, you need to go back and you need to tell them that AR 15s are used in the majority of mass shootings in this country. And I said, do you know that? <laughs> and he was like, I mean, it's everywhere. And I'm like, well, no, like, actually, do you know that? Because I've started to actually look at this data, because if you look at it, there were school shootings before Columbine. There were a number of school shootings before Columbine, but our media lasered in on Columbine, which was awful, absolutely awful. And it is grotesque what's happening in our country. And we need to figure out how to stop that. But Columbine was really post the OJ Simpson era of television. And it was when we would laser in on something and then just not let it go. And mm. we wouldn't cover the news that actually affected the majority of Americans. I mean, in the OJ Simpson trial, you know, the majority of Americans, while it was contentious, and I remember my great grandmother being on one side and my other great grandmother, my step great grandmother being on the other side, um, she was, uh, you know, completely sure that OJ Simpson was guilty and my, <laughs> my, my biological grandmother was not convinced, <laughs> which I still don't know how, but, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, it was like everybody got involved in this and we weren't paying attention to the actual news that mattered, which was the Internet was going to upend all of our jobs, our, you know, status quo. And we were not paying attention. I remember my dad was working at Pizza Hut and he was like, you know, oh, 
um, you know, people aren't going to order pizza on the internet, Johanna. Well, <laughs> and now a robot can serve it to you. <laughs> you can order it from the internet. And then I did see in LA, one of those little carts driving down the street to deliver someone's pizza. And those things actually matter a lot. Like right now, the writers strike, what they're striking for matters a lot because they're striking to make sure that artificial intelligence doesn't take their jobs. So there are stories that are really important. And News Nation, what I'm proud about is though we're imperfect, which I will always say that, like President Obama, we are trying to do better. And Sherry Great, who's the vice president of news there, I was really um, impressed with her because I was saying, you know, in the aftermath of Don Lemon and Tucker Carlson being fired, of course, a lot of people at News Nation have all sorts of different experience in these news organizations, and they know very well the problems with those news organizations, which there is at times where people are shut down on not telling <laughs> the truth or they're not allowed to say what they actually believe. And that's what I find so refreshing. And I told Mick Mulvaney, who's a Trump administration appointee when he came to the news station, I said, the thing you're gonna love Mick is you can say whatever you the truth is and nobody's gonna stop you. And um, and it's your truth, right? Because there there are facts and that's what the journalists are covering. But there's also some, you know, like Mick Mulvaney experienced his White House experience different than I experienced my White House experience. And we can have that conversation in different ways. We have different opinions, but we can present them and then present the facts. And what I was so proud of what Sherry Grach said when I said, you know, we could talk about this. She said, is this news that affects most Americans? And I was like, you are right. No. And she's like, look, like I saw, you know, the segment that basically was talking about, oh, you know, do we feel sorry for these people or whatever? And it's like, these people have been enormously successful, have had platforms for a very long time, not always for their own doing. And, you know, they got fired and, and who knows why, but is that actually going to affect most Americans? And the truth is no smoke monster. And what's actually happening with, you know, the changing situation in terms of our health, that affects Americans. The cancer rates going up in one location, a potential, you know, serial killer on the loose, which they're covering in, you know, whether it's Oregon, that actually does affect people. And so what I love is that they're trying to do that. And like I said, it's going to be imperfect, but, but the the movement is there which is why i signed on early to say you know can we bring eyeballs back to the news that matters and we'll see whether we're successful i mean i i want us to be successful but i know there are enough people i know the majority of people actually care barbara about what you're saying and so there will be an effort that breaks through on that and they've just got to do it in the right respect empower include way so that we all are operating on the same facts you know another thing that you say that i love is this notion of um breaking eggs because mm. i think that relates to what you're talking about so yeah. what is what does that mean to you and why is it important that we're not afraid to break some eggs I remember when I said that to you, Barbara, I said, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to break some eggs here. <laughs> and what I meant was, um, I'm going to tell the truth means that you're going to say things that your friends are going to sometimes be like, oh my God, I can't believe you just said that. But what I want to say is the truth. You know, we probably should not be running an 80 year old candidate for the job of president of the United States of America. Will, you know, we have to see who our options are when it comes to the general election? Yes, but I'm not gonna sit here and just say, oh yes, you know, of course, he's completely agile and completely <laughs> able to do this every day because that's not the truth. So, you know, if you're going to make a difference and you're going to, I think people just want to hear the truth. 
They don't want to hear you say, you know, oh, Trump's all bad, because by the way, everything he did was not all bad. And, you know, people on the Democratic side will get mad at me. They say that I'm, you know, I'm doing a false equivalency between progressives and MAGA extremes. And by no means am I saying that, you know, someone who says, you know, like, uh, a leaker is, uh, you know, because right now you have uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course, when it was uh, the the military leaker, she said, oh, it's no big deal playing it down. And and that's inexcusable. Right. But if I hear that from any progressive or anyone, I'm going to say the same, which is like, why are we letting people do it here and it's okay and not people who are doing it here and that's not okay like we should all be questioning everything our own assumptions too and I didn't hear enough of that so I think there's a way to do it I hope diplomatically but the truth is probably some people are gonna get upset with me and that's okay Wait, this is going back. I love this as kind of the essence of what it is to be on message. If your message is actually saying and communicating something instead of just talking for the sake of talking, you can't be afraid to break some eggs if you're going to say something of substance. Doesn't mean you're setting out to break eggs, but you can't be afraid of it. I yeah, love this as a takeaway. I think you're right. Like too many people are they're just doing whatever they think the cameras want them to do. And I've seen it firsthand. And it was shocking to me because I guess I thought people on television believed what they were saying. And then when I realized that a lot of them don't actually care, I was like, oh my God, this is awful. Like I care a lot, <laughs> very much. So I care about the public school mom last night who I had a long conversation with in the aftermath of our school district having a lot of questions because some people are worried about the sex ed curriculum at our school. And she told me I'm very conservative and these are my values. And I care as much that she's respected in our system that I'm respected in our system. And like, I... I care that enough that I'm going to tick off some of my friends on the left to say it, but it needs to be said and not because I just want eyeballs because that is the wrong reason to be in this business. Like I never want to be in the position in which I've sold myself for the highest number of eyeballs. I want to sell myself for that mom to be heard as much as a mom to be heard who has a kid who is going through whether they are questioning whether they're a girl or a boy and she just wants that kid to have an education too they all deserve our respect more than we deserve people have eyes on us and so that's probably what I meant, Barbara, by breaking some eggs and we'll see whether it works. <laughs> I love it. And one thing you mentioned to me too was, you know, um, learning to use your voice because now you have, you know, you were behind the scenes, yeah. which I can totally relate to. And now um, you're in front of the camera and you're certainly on the microphone. So yeah. what's been that evolution for you? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, and it is, it's funny because I, I really, the, the truth is I truly care about these things. So I'm like, um, well, is that one of the motivators is you care so much that it's like whatever hesitance or resistance or identified as a behind the scenes person. It's like, I'm willing, I, the, the first time, moral clarity and the need to participate Yeah, kind of bigger first, than the private person side. The first time I went on television, I was awful. <laughs> I mean, awful. I think I was like, you know, playing with me. And I, I was just 
and I had butterflies in my stomach and I hated it. I hated it so much. And um, <laughs> I was like, that was terrifying. I never want to do that again, ever. <laughs> and it was- um, Wait, I mean, Can I interrupt? Because I want to yeah. get more of the story. But just to give some context, it's like, okay, you know, you're spending your days with the leader of the three world, mm -hmm. one of the most impactful people, you know, in yep. our history. And, yep. and you were speaking to other leaders of the world. Oh so, yeah. No, I, I, so like, this I, I literally, I was in charge of, you know, I'm standing backstage with Chancellor Merkel and at that time, president, French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron had just come into office and I'm trying to have a protocol this conversation with them on who needs to go first to brief their press, because finally we had decided, yes, we were going to have their press briefed. I had done all of that. I had worked with press in an off the record, you know, scenario where I would bring them to the situation room to plan out trips, to go overseas, to, you know, like, again, for a live address to the nation in Afghanistan, or the stakes are extraordinarily high. So it wasn't like I hadn't worked with press before. So I had what's done so this, terrifying but about being on camera. This is the essence of my podcast and the notion of camera readiness. You have function. You have been literally, if you said the wrong thing, you know, to- I mean, the stakes were super high. Like right? so that's what I'm saying. You, you, you sailed through that with flying colors. And I can tell you, you always looked great and your hair looks amazing and got that smile. I mean, my whole point is, so it's like, you have, so what, it, because it's, if you're scared of going on camera, what's it like for the rest of us is what I'm getting at. So what was so terrifying <laughs> oh, oh. about TV? Uh, so, you know, I think it's, for me, it was the first time that the camera had been looking at me. I had been orchestrating the cameras for everybody else. And I hadn't ever been thinking about what I was saying. And now I was up in my head and I was thinking about it, right? Like, what am I going to say? And, and at the time I was like, who am I going to tick off? And I was thinking about like all of the different things. And I was just awful. I don't even know what I sputtered out. It was like, I didn't say anything about the behind the scenes conversations or anything like that, because I didn't trust myself. I was mm -hmm. busy thinking about, you know, what would they want to hear? What would they want to know? Like, and what would they, this anchor? And then the question she asked me, it wasn't, it was like a local station and it was, I, I was awful. <laughs> and, um, and so I thought I'm really bad at this instead of, I just didn't do my homework and talk to the people who have done this a lot and figure out how I'm going to be me. And that was one thing that then I was, you know, I've known a lot of these journalists for a long time and they knew that I would tell the truth. So I was asked to go on Fox during the Trump administration. And, um, and again, I remember being terrified, butterflies, stomach, like, <laughs> and like it was not a pleasant experience ever. Every time I was doing it, it was just like, oh my God. But sometimes it would be like off camera. It would be like, you know, conversations about our kids and, you know, whatever. And then it cut to camera and it's like, Johanna, why are you defending the spawn of Satan? <laughs> I didn't know I was defending the spawn of Satan. <laughs> I tried to hold it together. <laughs> and, you know, the thing that was, that I found was when I was telling the truth and I was just myself, it resonated. So once I learned the, the medium and that I just had to tell the truth, I really needed to find an environment that would let me do that. And that's not easy in the media world. And so then I had to figure out like with podcasts that I had originally launched, um, I had always wanted to do something bipartisan, but some of the women who I knew very well during the election cycle leading up to the Trump administration, um, the second Trump uh, election, were not willing to go out there on a limb against 
Donald Trump without any um, revenue because a lot of their jobs are pretty dependent on whoever's in charge in the Republican Party, which you know some can say that's problematic. And um, I can tell you there are a lot of Democrats who would do the same. Like they're not they're unwilling to you know, go out there and say the truth when it comes to Joe Biden, because their jobs are dependent on it. So we didn't get Republicans to table. We launched with three of us um, from the uh, Obama administration. And I found my voice with other women. And I think I realized, you know, to really fully be myself, I've got to be a little bit on my own. Mm -hmm. which is why now I've launched Press Advance and I'm having conversations with all sorts of different people. But I just don't want someone else saying, why did you ask that question, Johanna? Like, that's, you know, a crazy question because I've got to develop what I actually want to ask without somebody else's, you know, questions of that coming into my head. So, you know, now in this new media environment, you can do that with the podcast. Um, and uh, and so I did with Press Advance. Uh, what I love, again, about News Nation was on election night, they let me do that. And I said, you know, I was going to say difficult things that would affect people in the room if I had to say it. And they were all like, oh, God, what's she going to say? <laughs> <laughs> and my husband was like, "Is still always like that." <laughs> she gonna say? <laughs> um, and I've learned to trust myself, and I think that's the most important thing to media training, Barbara. And something that you teach so well is that the camera is going to be a reflection of who you are. And if you know who you are, bring it. Make sure you are always prepared, that you've done your homework, that you know what you're talking about, but then just be your authentic self and that's going to come through. And once you start doing that, then I think people have a reason to listen. That's fantastic. I love the way you said that. My one final question then is just a little fun tag for you. What is the on message of Press Advance going forward? On message for Press Advance is listening. It's listening to really smart people who I disagree with or who I agree with, but it's listening and trying to figure out how in this moment we actually press advance. So how do we tackle the biggest issues that are facing us as Americans, whether that's our education system, whether that's our economy, whether that is some of our climate disasters that are happening, our you know emergency preparedness, um, all of those things. How do we move beyond this moment where you just tune out to someone you may disagree with and we could actually press advance on this moment of toxicity and that's going to be my goal <laughs> no matter where i am or what i'm doing is trying to figure out like i know President Obama is probably sitting and trying to figure out how does how do we create the future that includes us all? Mm, what a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much. This is an incredible conversation. My pleasure. And I'm grateful that I got to do it in front of my son's art. Oh, I, it's beautiful. This bean, this I, bean I, that I had. I, so I want to get on the, the, the Hugh waiting list. Those are stunning. <laughs> He's, yeah. 11 years old. Incredible. So. so thank you so much, Johanna. And I want to thank everyone for listening. I really appreciate you. If you're looking to tap into your greatness and become all that you're meant to be, including a better leader and maybe a more impactful subject expert and media personality, please shoot me a note via my website, ableintermedia.com. And be sure to download my free ebook, 12 Tips for Success on Camera. And as always, 
please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already.